Hey, our church, happy Sunday. Hope you're doing well. Hopefully you're enjoying our virtual experience. As you can tell, we are in between experiences here at our Monarch Theater. We have drive-in coming. This is specifically for you at Virtual Experience. You are in for a special treat. Dean's message, part two of Jesus Said, and uh, you're gonna love it, I promise you. He gave me a little sneak peek this past week. I assure you, this message is gonna be for you. All right, the Virtual Experience starts now. is falling when fear is coming still you're calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted you will be my strength when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me I've decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Cause your love is holding on And it won't let go I feel it breaking out Like an echo Cause your love is holding on And it won't let go I feel it breaking out Like an echo An echo in my soul season you keep repeating promises to me now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me I've decided I'm not you won't give up on me, you won't give up on me Cause your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Cause your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo, an echo in my soul I've decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Cause your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Cause your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Cause your love is holding on Hallelujah, my way 
weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Everybody, it's Dean. Welcome to part two of this message that I've been doing. It started last week. I hope you, if you haven't watched it yet, it's right here on the site. So just go back and catch up. But we're walking through John chapter 11. All summer, really, we've been going through just one chapter and just one story. It's the story of Lazarus a man who was dead for four days. And after four days, Jesus spoke words and he was animated back to life. So uh, I'm just so excited that you're with me. And I, and I wanna encourage you, you're more influential than you know. If you hit send this and you send this video to somebody that might need it, I think it's, it could really be impactful. You know, we all have a circle of influence. I love that picture. You can picture a circle, can't you? And that everybody has different characters in their circle. And 
Only you impact the people in your circle like you do. There are other people in the circle, but they react differently to different things. You can be influential. So do share, would you please? And thank you to all of you who are coming on the weekends. These messages, these virtual messages are just for you. I try to tailor them to all my friends that are at home during this lockdown and to be a part of it. So let me read to you if I can from John chapter 11, verses 44 through 46. Here's where we're at in the story as we talk about holding on to promises instead of problems. It says, Then in front of everyone, Lazarus, who had died four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. He still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around his hands and his feet and covering his face. Jesus said to him, Unwrap him and let him loose. From that day forward, many of those who had come to visit Mary believed in him, believed in Jesus, for they had seen with their own eyes this amazing miracle. Here's a little parenthetical comment in verse 46. But a few went back to inform the Pharisees about what Jesus had done. I just love this. I love it <laughs> that a man's come alive. Some people are there. I, I want you to pay attention since we started talking about circles. I want you to pay attention to the circle around Lazarus. You have Mary, the sister who believes who Jesus, Jesus is with, and they call out. There is another sister too, but it specifically mentions Mary. So I guess a lot of the people who had come around the grave, around the home, had come for Mary. Well, why would they come for Lazarus? He was dead. They didn't come for Jesus because they didn't know many of them that Jesus was going to be there. They certainly wouldn't have come for the disciples. They came for Mary. They came for the family, which is why you go to memorials. It's why you go to funerals, because the man in the casket is gone, and he's not coming back. The woman at, at, at the front of the memorial service in her casket is not coming back. So we come for the living. And some people were there for the living. And then other people had come with Jesus because they were just following Jesus. So you have some around, circling around the family. You have some that had come with Jesus. You had some that were enemies and they're just following like a private investigator in an old movie. You know what I'm talking about. The old gumshoe movies where somebody is always following somebody to get a picture or to get a piece of evidence. Some people are following to watch Jesus trip up, to hear him say something that might be against the religious laws. So you have all of this happening. Now, it's common sense to think that they might come to the grave with different motivations. But what's shocking is that they leave the grave with different motivations. The dude was dead for four days and he comes out wrapped in grave clothes. The Bible says it even had a piece of, they call it a napkin, the piece that covers his face. He couldn't see. It's like, a, like one of, again, one of those old movies where the mummy comes out and he's all wrapped up. This is, this is what's happening. And people still leave, some still leave, and want to tattletale to the other enemies. I, I don't know if you, if you thought about it, but could you imagine seeing a dead man come back to life and still being a cynic? And yet some are. Today I want to talk about how we, that when we hold on to promises, what it does to us is entirely different than when we hold on to problems. When we hold on to what can be, it is totally transformational 
in a positive way. When we hold on to what's already been or what's already happened, it is totally transformational in a deleterious, is the fancy word, in a negative, in a decaying sense. It starts to dilute, tear down, decay the soul. This last week, while I was standing on the roof of this church, here's what I said. I said that there is power. People who understand the day they live in. I was speaking out of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Look it up. In chapter 11, verse 4, it says that... (laughs) Uh, it's, it's just sharing this idea that people who see clouds in the sky and say, oh, it's too cloudy, I'm not going to plant seed. Or they see some rain coming down and they say, it's too rainy, I'm not going to reap a harvest. Those people are fools. Because weather has nothing to do with season. When it's time to plant seed, you got to get the seed in the ground doesn't matter if it's rainy or dark or a little cloudy. It's an absurdity. And yet I believe that's what's happening in our day. I believe, and this is a prophetic word. I want to give it to you, okay? I believe this is a season for planting. It's a season for planting some things and harvesting other things. And all anybody's talking about is how cloudy it is, how hard it is with COVID and how difficult the economy is. Yes, yes, not a denial. Yes, it's dangerous out there. Yes, it's dark out there. Yes, it's economically challenging for everybody, everybody. But is this the time to plant? some things and harvest other things yeah and if you miss it you're going to miss the opportunity i believe inside of me there's a promise from god that says dean this is the time to start new things to reap a harvest from old things that you planted long ago and they weren't blooming six months ago or they weren't blooming four years ago but they're blooming now i can feel it it's like a pent-up energy pastor luke our worship pastor said that to me this week he said i can feel in the worship services, I can feel in our conversations, our vision talks about what's going on in the future and what's happening in the 253 community. He said, I can feel a pent up energy. And the picture he used was like a rubber band that was pulled back and ready to let fly, you know? I love that. So question number one, there's a couple of key questions. If you're gonna be the type of person that's surrounding Lazarus and you walk away going, hallelujah, I believe, There's a few things you have to know, and you have to be careful. I'm going to give you three different ways you can walk this way, right? There are those people, number one, that know of Jesus. They know of Jesus. There are those that know about Jesus, and there are those that know Jesus. The idea in life is to slowly move from just knowing of him, that you had heard his name somewhere that you kind of grew up in a couple of times in Sunday school or somebody. Every Muslim knows of Jesus. Every Buddhist has heard his name. Every atheist has heard his name. Some say he hasn't lived. Some say he never lived. Some say he was just a man, but they know of him. This is the most rudimentary level. Then there are those, and I, I put the masses in this category, They know about Jesus. They know data. They know the Christmas story. They know the manger. They they know Lazarus coming out of the grave. Maybe they've heard that Jesus walked on water. Maybe they can pull up, you know, eight or nine of the 12 disciples. They can pull up their names and think of them. You know, they know the resurrection story. They saw the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. Ah, that's good. It's good. One is knowing of him, sort of this ethereal, I guess I know that name, but I don't know the story. Then you get closer. You're getting closer when you know about him. You know data. You know the basic arc of the story. You know the basic claims. But when you know 
Jesus. I mean, really know him like I know Abe, <laughs> like I know my son, like I know my wife. When I know not just data about him, but I start to hear their hearts and they hear my heart and they know what pleases me and doesn't please me and they know what breaks my heart. They know what makes me cry. Sometimes I'll be watching television with my daughter. This happened the other night. I was on the left side of the couch and she was on the right side of the couch and we were watching uh, a movie that had a little melancholy in it, a little sadness. And when it came to the, a moment that might uh, you know, be a little emotional, my daughter just turns her head to the left and she has a big smile on her face because she loves to see her dad cry. And I am a sucker for sad movies or sad commercials or sad YouTubes. I just get so, I just cry. And she said, I knew it. I knew you were going to cry. You know what makes me happy? It makes me happy that she knows me. She can anticipate what will break my heart. I know that sounds silly, but it makes me delighted. Here's what we want to get to. Are, when we're watching Jesus do miracles, are we connected enough to know him or do we just know of him? The, the people that were there and they run off and tell the Pharisees, they don't know Jesus, they just know of him. Maybe they want to find out a little about him, but they really just wanted to tear him down. They saw a dead man come back to life. And they still went to tattletale. Their motive wasn't in the right, not to know him. Do you know what I mean? To know him and hear. Here's an interesting chapter. I want to read this to you. It's from Matthew chapter 16. This is the words of Jesus. It says, one day some of the Pharisees and those of the Jewish sect known as the Sadducees approached Jesus. It says, insisting that he proved to them that he was the Messiah. Now imagine, this is before Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. They were saying to Jesus, why don't you raise someone from the dead? They had said that a miracle would convince them, and it didn't. Anyway, they said, show us a supernatural sign from heaven, they demanded. Jesus answered, you can read the signs of the weather, for you say, Red sky at night, sailors delight. And red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. You're so adept at forecasting the weather by looking at the sky, but you're absolutely clueless in reading the obvious signs of the times. The other day, I was out on a boat with uh, some friends, including my aunt Sharon. And Sharon quoted that little proverb that Jesus mentioned, red sky at night, sailors delight, meaning they knew tomorrow was going to be a great day. Uh, I, I just want you to pay attention to these two passages that I've read today, side by side. Here's one, and it's preceding the miracle called Lazarus where the Pharisees are saying, show us, show us a sign, show us a sign. And Jesus says, you can tell what tomorrow is going to be like by the color of the sky, but you clearly can't tell what's going on here. Yeah, because Jesus was doing miracles and they didn't believe. He was about to do one of, if not the greatest miracle that he ever did. With the... I guess the only exception being his own resurrection. A guy was dead and decaying, and Jesus reversed the decay and brought him out. But they still didn't get it because they just knew of Jesus. They just knew about Jesus. Attending church will give you data about Jesus going to Sunday school, having a grandmother that loved God. What I'm asking you this summer is, can you tell what the sign of the times are? This is the time for holding on to the promises, not the problems. This is the time to be bold, not shy. This is the time 
for faith, not fear. This is, can you see it? I know you can tell me, my, my phone can tell me what the weather is going to be like in six days. My phone can tell me the exact temperature or a pretty close approximation. Okay, big deal. I'm talking about being able to see in the supernatural. And for this, you have to know Jesus here. Not just about him here. So I'm going to close today by doing something a little different. I'm just going to mod. Let's just do it together. I know it's virtual. I know you're sitting there and I'm sitting here. I know some of you are watching this at night and others first thing in the morning. But let's just have a moment with Jesus. Jesus, we're aware of all the facts, or most of them, about what's going on in this world. Number of deaths, number of sicknesses, those infected. We hear the things about elections, and we know economic reports. We know leading indicators. We know lagging indicators. We all have various areas of expertise in those areas that we work and labor and make money. And we know of you. We know there's a man named Jesus who lived. Some of us even know about you. We know the stories. We read the book. But right now, Jesus, we want to say we're sorry for not knowing you to be an intimate of yours. Lord, I confess that at times I can forget to slow down and just talk to you, be close to you. I get overwhelmed by what the news is saying, by what social media is saying. I can get discouraged or sidetracked by what people have said or done to me or about me. We get so self-focused. Right now we just want to focus on you. Reveal yourself to us. Show us what the day is. We, we can see the weather, but we want to know the season. The season. Give the people that are connected to this church. We call it our church because it's not mine and it's not theirs. It's ours. We're in this together with you. You are our leader. You're the head of the church. And we're your bride. That's the picture. That's an intimate picture right where these friends sit. If they're laying in bed, right where they lie. If they're walking, listening on, a, on their exercise, right where they're walking. Show up, show up, show up. Give them insights, miracles, miracles. Things that come back to life uh, so that they would know what season it is for them. Give them hope, hope. And the old, the words of that old hymn, Jesus, 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 there's just something about your name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain Jesus 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name. God, whatever is passing away, we'll let it pass away. But we want to hold on to whatever promise you've given. So speak to your friends, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of it. This is sign language. It means I love you. And I'm so glad that you and I are connected, not just virtually, but heart to heart and through Jesus. Hope this is an encouragement to you. Do share it with somebody. And thank you to all of you who are giving online. It means the world that so many people have been supportive. All right, blessings. What'd I tell you? 
I told you you would love that talk. Uh, hey, listen, thank you so much for uh, being so generous. I know we have been in some unique times, but uh, you have been so faithful from the very beginning. And I just can't say thank you enough. Thank you for being generous. Thank you for being faithful. You know the routine. There's a couple ways that you can give. One of those ways is by texting our church to 77977. That's our church to 77977. You can give like that. We call it the social distancing way to give. Other ways you can give, uh, you can smell in your check. Of course, you can come by anytime. Come check out the campus. Listen, even if you don't want to come inside the Monarch because you still like the virtual or the drive-in, you got to come see the place. No matter what's going on in your life, we love you. We miss you. We hope to see you soon. Have a great week.